Hi everyone, thank you so much for joining me back here for another episode of Crime and Wine. My name is Ariana, or Ari to the YouTube fam. It's been a while since I've put out a video and I am so sorry about that. There's been so many new things happening in my life, so many transitions, um, exciting stuff nonetheless, but um, one big news I love to share with my YouTube fam is that I am now engaged and I am so excited. Um, so definitely follow me on my Instagram, my TikTok, just stay up to date with me. I'd love to connect with you on those platforms as well. Um, but with that being said, we are back and today we've got an interesting case. So in honor of spooky season and October today, we're covering a case that has inspired the making of a true crime Halloween movie. And I know you're probably wondering which movies have actually ha are based on a true crime story, which there are quite a few and I do plan to cover at least a couple more before October ends because I think that would just be super fun. So if you guys have a movie that you know is based off a true crime, uh, leave it down in the description below and I will look at them and do some research and maybe I'll cover it in my next video. But today we are covering the movie Nightmare on Elm Street and I was actually surprised that this was one of the ones that in, was based off a true crime story. So with that being said, grab your glass of wine and let's get into today's case. <gasps> Today, we are going to be talking about the very, very popular movie, Nightmare on Elm Street. And you all are probably well aware of this movie, um, but just in case you are not, the first movie, a Nightmare on Elm Street was released in 1984 and this was the beginning of an entire movie franchise which consisted of nine movies, a television series, novels, comic books, and a ton of other forms of content. The overall plot of the franchise centers around the fictional character Fred or Freddy Krueger the apparition of a former child killer who was burned alive by the vengeful parents of his victims, who returns from the grave to then terrorize and kill the teenage residents of Springwood, Ohio in their dreams. The films collectively grossed over $472 million at the box office worldwide upon its release. And while I have seen the movie, somewhat. I'm personally not the biggest fan of gory movies, although I do really enjoy watching horror movies and I was, again, extremely intrigued to see that the director of this film, Wes Craven, was actually inspired by a true crime story which birthed the making of this incredible franchise, A Nightmare on Elm Street. This is quite an interesting case because I guess it could be considered an unsolved mystery till this day, which if you guys are anything like me, I am not personally the biggest fan of diving into unsolved mysteries. Um, I guess some people really enjoy those types of cases, but for me specifically, with my personality, I naturally like resolutions and conclusions, so having unsolved mysteries is like an itch on the brain. So. Yeah, let me know if you like Unsolved Mysteries though. I am always intrigued by how one is inspired and this case is very fascinating to me. So it actually started when director Craven was reading a series of newspaper articles printed in the LA Times newspaper and it, this was back in the 1970s and it was about a group of Khmer refugees who, after fleeing to America from the Khmer Rouge genocide in Cambodia, were suffering from disturbing nightmares, after which they refused to sleep. So a little context, the Khmer people are a specific group of people that are native to Cambodia, and they compromise over 90% of Cambodia's population of 17 million, and between 1974 and 1979, Cambodia came under the rule of the Khmer Rouge, which was the name that was popularly given to members of the Communist Party of Kampuchea. And despite a massive American bombing campaign, which was also known as Operation Freedom Deal, 
against them. The Khmer Rouge won the Cambodian Civil War when they captured the Cambodian capital and overthrew the Khmer Republic in 1975. So the Khmer Rouge murdered hundreds of thousands of their perceived political opponents and its racist emphasis on national purity resulted in the genocide of Cambodian minorities. Such an awful case. And summary executions and torture were carried out by its cadres against perceived subversive elements or during genocidal purges of its own ranks between 1975 and 1978. So ultimately the Cambodian genocide led to the deaths of 1.5 to 2 million people, um, which is around 25% of Cambodia's population. So this was a very, very sad and difficult time for the residents of Cambodia, whether they were natives to Cambodia or Vietnamese or another Southeast Asian descent. And this led to many of them escaping and taking refuge in the United States. So believe it or not, this is the crazy part because there was an article in the LA Times that was about a Cambodian family coming to America to escape this mass genocide that was happening in the killing fields. And so they safely made it to the United States and all was fine until the young boy in the family was terrified to sleep because he felt that if he slept, he would be killed by something chasing him. He would force himself to stay awake for days at a time and eventually he ended up dying in the middle of a nightmare. This became the basis for A Nightmare on Elm Street, but it doesn't just end there. So Craven had found just one of many articles detailing the sleep-induced death of a Hmong refugee. Having fled to genocide in Laos, Cambodia, and Vietnam for a new life in America, many Hmong began suffering from extremely violent, potentially PTSD-related nightmares. Well, PTSD, they thought. They were so horrifying, in fact, that many refused to sleep for fear of dying. And I recently found an article that was published in 1987 in the LA Times that was talking about these very unfortunate scenarios that were happening during this time, specifically from the perspective of the medical examiners during all of this. In April of 1983, at least 130 Southeast Asian refugees had left the world in essentially the same way. They cried out in their sleep and then they died. Medical authorities would end up calling this the Asian Death Syndrome. The refugees had various names for it and one of them became known as Night Terror. As a deputy of Cook County Medical Examiner, Kirshner, he investigated five nightmare deaths himself, including a Laotian father and son who died in a Northside Chicago apartment, in bed, asleep, and only 15 months apart. So of course, spurred by curiosity and concern, Kirshner, who was an associate professor of pathology at the University of Chicago, um, undertook a systemic study of the problem. His results, based on data from the Federal Centers for Disease Control and autopsies of 18 night terror victims, were recently reported in the Journal of the American Medical Association. The victims had much in common. Kirshner found first and foremost that nothing seemed to be wrong with them before they suddenly died. That's so scary. He would say, quote, these are all healthy men with no previous symptoms. The average age was 33. He goes on to say, quote, the situation is almost always the same. It only occurs in men and it only occurs in their sleep. The report is that they cry out and die or are found dead the next morning. Standard autopsies would also reveal little about the deaths other than that they were caused by a sudden heart stoppage. 
such an occurrence in Asians is mystifying, they would say, since their rates of ordinary cardiac disease and malfunction are extraordinarily low, primarily due to their low-fat diet. So, I don't know, guys. But detailed examinations of the victim's hearts performed by a doctor called Dr. Fredrich Eckner of the University of Illinois College of Medicine turned up something strange. All of the 18 hearts were slightly enlarged and 17 of those showed defects in their conduction systems in the array of fibers that carries electronic impulses from the brain to the heart. The fibers were frayed and curled as if, Kirshner would say, quote, their hearts just shorted out. It is Kirshner's theory that something at night, perhaps a random electronic discharge, and yes, perhaps a nightmare, overloaded these defective hearts, causing the sudden deaths. So this makes the nightmare death all the more curious, since studies of whites who die suddenly had not shown the same defect. So this led to Kirshner speculating that genetics probably plays a role in the defect, which may be present from birth. Nightmare deaths are only found in certain Asian populations as well, such as Laos, Cambodia, Vietnam, as well as the Philippines and Japan. It has not once been reported in China. The craziest part is that 10 years later, doctors had been studying this extremely mysterious phenomenon, whereby this time it had claimed more than 104 men averaging 33 years of age and only one woman, according to Dr. Gib Parrish, a CDC medical epidemiologist. 98% of the deaths occurred between 10 p.m. and 8 a.m. and in 1981, the peak year of these deaths, which was 26 men, often Hmong refugees from the highlands of the northern Laos, died in their sleep. Usually victims were simply found dead, but when medics arrived quickly, the men's hearts were fibrillating or contracting wildly. This has led to a lot of spe speculation on what could possibly be causing SUNDS. Some doctors suspected poor diet as the longer the refugees were living away from the camps on the killing fields, uh, the more likely they were to live. Um, but then you got others that speculated that it could be due to exposure to chemical nerve agents during the Vietnam War, but that was dispelled quickly because in an LA Times article, a medical examiner mentioned that if there were a chemical agent, it doesn't make sense that it would affect only men and only during a specific time frame in the evening. And some Hmong members felt that they were being punished by spirits for leaving and abandoning their homelands. Well guys, I know that is just such a strange case. For it to have inspired the director to make The Nightmare on Elm Street makes it all the more creepy. And now I really want to go back and watch that movie just knowing that this that movie is not very far-fetched it actually happened and we still don't know how that is happening till this day if you guys have heard about that at all at any point let me know in the comments section below um but yeah you guys should definitely watch the movie again um let me know if you are a horror movie fan or not and also if you know of a case that has inspired the making of a movie i'd really like to know that and maybe i'll cover it for the next video before october ends um i think it would be really cool later down the line or at some point to watch a movie with you guys whether i live stream it or we do it through a separate platform or something um let me know if that's something you guys would be interested in but with that being said Thank you guys again for joining me back here for another episode. If you have not yet subscribed, then please consider subscribing if you like today's content and please leave a like on this video. Um, and of course, leave your thoughts down below. And I'll see you guys back here for another episode of Crime and Wine.